This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. More on them in a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. This one, we're covering the Hinter Kaifeg murders. If you're new to the show, what happens here? One of my writers writes me a script. I've never read it before. It's called A Cold Read. We're going to explore it together. And uh, let's just jump into it, so we should be today. Oh, I should say thank you, Angus, who is the uh, writer for today's script. Thank you, Jen, who does the editing on this channel always. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, dear viewer or listener, if you're listening to this as a podcast. Welcome, welcome. Let's jump in. Of all the unforeseen consequences of the internet, sleuthing has been one of the most fortuitous. It's one of the best parts of my job that I get to see people working together on a century-old case with no expected reward, other than the possibility that they might get an answer. And while we all love a good conclusion to a story, life is not always so kind. I also like it when these online sleuths in these like forums and sh they're like, we're gonna find someone who's like around today. <laughs> Like, that's more intense, because then it's like, there are so many people hunting for you. And you got to be, like, out there as a criminal, being like, oh, no. <laughs> Are they gonna? Or, like, the ancestry sh where it's like, none of, hey, 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 family members, do not get ancestry tests. <laughs> Why not, Grandpa? Because they're going to find familial DNA and find out that are responsible for all those murders. Ah. It is a secret you must carry to your grave. And while we all love a good conclusion to a story, life is not always so kind. Sometimes the truth is lost to history, with people left asking. Today is one such story. The sad, twisted tale of a family whose own story got cut short and left only questions in its wake. Well, leading strong there, Angus. So anyone watching this episode is going to be like, oh, it's got an unsatisfactory ending. <laughs> You're going to get to the end and be disappointed. We'll just tell you that up front so you could click off if you want and destroy my viewer retention. Thanks, Angus. Brilliant work. Please don't go. Just kidding. Just kidding. We love you, Angus. Hinter Kaifek. Our story begins at the end of March 1922 in a small farmstead, southern Germany. Oh, God. I'm like, oh no, Germany. You've got so many long and barely pronounceable words, Germany. Why? It's very difficult. Roughly seven kilometers northwest of... No, I know that one. That's Munich. Everyone knows that one. And three kilometers from the nearby town of Weidhofen. There would be little to discern this farmstead from any of the hundreds of others that dot the landscape of this picturesque part of the world. It has a barn, a house, a machine shed, animal sheds, and it's all centered around your typical cobblestone yard. Uh, it's picturesque, isn't it? And that's where the murders are gonna happen. <laughs> the inhabitants of this farm are six in total. The Gruber family and their maid. Andreas Gruber, age 63, and his wife. Note here. It's spelt like Cazilia, um, but apparently you pronounce it like Cecilia. Uh, Angus says he's going to write it as Cecilia for the rest of the script for simplicity. Thank you, Angus. I do have a small brain. I do, I'm not even joking. I, that is very helpful for me. Otherwise, I'm going to be like Cazilla. <laughs> like some sort of Godzilla. Age 71, they're the eldest and owners of the family farmstead. Their daughter, Victoria Gabriel, aged 35, is the war widow of a man called Carl Gabriel who died fighting in the First World War seven years prior in Arras, France. Victoria's eldest child, Cazilla. <laughs> Didn't you say you were going to change? Oh, okay. So there's a daughter who's also called Cazilla. And I know it's Cazilia, but I like Cazilla. Let's just call her Cazilla. So we've got Cecilia, who's the mother. Sorry, no, the grandmother of Cazilla. Cazilla Gabriel, named after her grandmother. <laughs> Big brain. Is age seven and the youngest is Joseph, aged only two. The family maid was Maria Baumgarter, age 44. Just a quick side notes on names. Like I said, there were two Cecilias living in the family. To save confusion, I'll refer to the younger Celia, Cecilia. Oh, God damn it. Godzilla or whatever her name is. Look, the granddaughter, whose name is also Cecilia, uh, by a nickname Cece, and the older Cecilia will just remain Cecilia. With that out of the way, we can get into it. <laughs> I'm not sure that's, that has made it easier. It's just a long way of getting there. The morning of March the 31st dawned bright and brisk on our small Bavarian farm as with most mornings, Andreas Gruber was the first to rise and begin milking his small herd of cows. A bite from the winter just past still hangs in the air and the remnants of the last snowfall still cling to the shaded corners of the yard, and soon it will be warm enough to move their small herd of cows out of the barn and into the field. All is quiet in the barn aside from the dulcet intonations of the cows, a fact that is reassuring to Andreas, what with all the strange goings-on of late. 
Mm. What strange goings on, Angus? Let's elaborate. I love it. Once the cows were milked, Andreas returns inside and is greeted by his family who are eating breakfast around the table. The family is expecting the arrival of their new maid at any moment. This was going to be her first day, the last maid having quit under suspicious circumstances several months ago. The clock strikes 11 a.m. and there's a knock at the door. <laughs> it's so like when people leave, like, I, I don't know, we've had, uh, me and my wife, so it's so hard to find like good babysitting. I know this is irrelevant to the story, but I just wanted to share like that their, their maid leaving. It was just, I'll just get a new maid. So I'm like, it's so hard. It's so much of a hassle. <laughs> oh my God, first world problems. The clock strikes 11 and there's a knock at the door. The maid, Maria Baumgartner and her sister are welcomed into the home and introduced to the family. She's shown to her room and is left to unpack while the family goes out to tend the fields. Why is her sister there? The maid just arrives with her sister. You'd be like, okay, I guess your sister's staying as well. That's not what we wanted. <laughs> if, like, if the babysitter comes, she's like, oh yeah, this is my family. Uh, okay, <laughs> come in. <laughs> she's shown her room and left to unpack while the family goes to tend the fields, and once she's settled, Maria's sister says farewell and returns to the local town. Though they thought this wasn't farewell for long, Maria's sister would be the last person to see the family alive. Oh, okay, so she was just dropping her off. That makes more sense. It wasn't until five days later that the bodies would be discovered. On the following day after our scene, two coffee salesmen, Hans and Eduard Shirovsky, arrived on the farm to take the family's regular order of coffee. After knocking for several minutes and receiving no reply, they looked around, noting that the machine room door had been left open. They continued their route to the nearest neighboring farm, who was also a customer of theirs. They knocked on Lorenz Schlittenbauer's door to take his order and asked if the Grubers had gone away. He said they hadn't, and the brothers moved on. Then, on the 4th of April, a local mechanic arrived at the farm to repair a food processing machine. After looking around and finding nobody except the family dog who had been running around the yard when he arrived, he decided to just wait to see if the family came back, but after an hour of waiting, still nobody had returned. He noticed that the machine room had been left unlocked, and there was also a brand new lock attached to the door. Assuming they were out and had left the door open for him, he decided to just start working and hoped they would arrive before he finished. It took him an hour to do this, so I'll be like, <laughs> after 10 minutes, I'll be like, alright, I'm just gonna check on the machine again with my work. Four hours later, though, he was done and heard nobody arriving or leaving. What was more, the family's dog was nowhere to be found when he exited the machine shed. I feel like if I arrived to fix these people's machine if we'd set an appointment and they were an hour late, I'd be so pissed off. I'd be like, oh, can't you just, why did you write it out? I came all the way out here to the middle of Buck Buck <laughs> nowhere Munich and uh, you didn't show up and then I'd find out that the whole family was dead and I'd feel bad about myself <laughs> and my rage which simmers inside me well, hey I'm really sorry too okay, <laughs> then on the fifth day after hearing from his son that Cece had not turned up to school and that the whole family had missed church on Sunday the neighbor Lorenz decided to send his sons over to the farm to investigate they looked around and reported that there was nobody anywhere near anywhere on the farm but when they had knocked they could hear the dog barking from inside the main house how did the dog get inside has someone murdered them and is now living in their house <laughs> And like taking care of their dog and sh that is super creepy dude now concerned lorenz gathered two friends and went to investigate for himself upon their arrival they searched the fields surrounding the property in the main farm buildings but found nobody what was more every door was locked though they could hear some strange noises coming from the barn with few other options they broke down the door just a quick note here a lot of this is based on digitized police documents that are themselves over a century old which makes the translations a bit rough well i, I am impressed it's that German efficiency. <laughs> I always feel like with Germany, there's so many like that, you know, ah, see German efficiency and all of these kind of like good German tropes that I'm always like, is that a little bit racist to be like, oh, the Germans are so efficient. <laughs> um, and what was the other thing? Oh yeah, whenever I do, uh, whenever I try to pronounce German words, someone wrote me on Twitter, it's just like, just try doing a German accent over it. So like, if you have something like, what was it? Um, I don't even know. Like, I can't see a German word right now, but they're just like doing a German accent. And I'm like, well, yeah, I might be getting it more accurate, but it sounds like I'm just being, you know, making fun of a German accent, which I mean is fun in itself. <laughs> is it appropriate? Is, maybe it won't be appropriate someday. And people will come back and look at these videos and be like, oh, Simon's being a racist again. <laughs> and we're like, I didn't mean it. Sorry. I can't tell what's going to be right and not right in the future. It's the future. Hey, Doc, success. Everything's cool. What was I saying? Oh, yeah. So the German, like, I'm pretty impressed that they're digitizing police records from a century ago. People on the internet who just love solving crimes are going to love that. 
With that in mind, I'll give you Lorenz's description of the events that followed. I led the way towards the stable door, but in front of it was a pile of hay. I tried to step through, but something caught my foot and I stumbled into the doorframe. I ignored my stumbling, (laughs) but Pell, who was walking behind me, called, There's a foot. I replied, That would be even nicer. (laughs) What is up with this translation? It's it's like Google Translates. (laughs) Oh, look, a dead body. That sounds nice. (laughs) Is that what the... Is that... I don't... Like, old-school German in a modern translator. Interesting results. I turned around and grabbed the foot, pulled it to the corner, and realized it was Andreas Gruber. I took a closer look and realized that there were more people lying on the ground around us. End quote. What they had found were the eldest members of the Gruber family, that being Cecilia and Andreas Gruber, Victoria, and Cece. Each one had the same star-shaped injury to the temple of their head. After finding the family, Lorenz made his way into the family's home. Inside, he found the body of the maid, Maria Baumgartner, in her living quarters, and most tragic of all, the body of the two-year-old Joseph still in his crib. Maria had the same star-shaped wound to the head, but young Joseph, possibly due to the fragility of his skull, had his head crushed. From here, Lorenz returned to the yard and told the others what he had found. After several minutes of discussion, the group decided to leave the house and inform the relevant authorities. Now, I'm not sure how things were done back in the day, but to my modern mind, I would assume that your first port of call was to tell the police. However, Lorenz told his companions to inform the mayor of the nearest town, which they did. After that, Lorenz then told his sons to go to the nearest telephone and inform the other members of the Gruber family what they had found. Meanwhile, word had spread and interested locals arrived at the farm to see. Lorenz did his best to prevent anyone from entering either the stable or the house until the police arrived. Now let me just interrupt today's video to tell you about today's fantastic sponsor, Curiosity Stream, which is the entertainment brand for people who want to know more. And look, you're, I, I, this is like a true crime show, but it's like, it's educational. You're here to hopefully learn something. And I think that's why Curiosity Stream is such a good tie-in for this channel. Curiosity Stream doesn't have a typical customer. The audience is only united by wanting to know more. Well, I don't know. I guess it's not a typical customer, is it? But like, I don't know. There's that certain type of person who likes learning shit. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I like those people. I like to think I'm one of those people. It's why I like Curiosity Stream. They describe it here as the Netflix for nerds, the Hulu for history buffs, the Disney Plus for the scientists in us. And it's also extremely affordable. Under $20. At, wait for it. Under $20. What, Simon? Do I hear you say month? $20 a month? That sounds reasonable. About the same as those other services that I subscribe to. Oh no, what's this? It's $20 a year, Simon? $20 a year? That makes it like less than $2 a month. I'm sure there's a specific figure that I can't find right now. $1.25 a month. It's way less than $2 a month. That's super... Oh no, that's... Oh, there's a discount code. What? I'll tell you about that in a bit. But just let me... me, Spoiler alert. You're going to get it for less than $20. What now? (laughs) Yes. They feature true stories that are entertaining and engaging without the reality show nonsense. Oh my god, major streaming service that begins with an N. Do you have a ton of that crap? Oh my lord. Uh, It's available on many platforms. Look, Web App Roku, the list is massive. If you have a device that was made in the last few years that is smart, you know, with a screen, it's going to be able to work on this. Uh, Science, nature, history, technology, tech, military history, music, and more. Recommend something. Actually, I don't want to recommend something. Curiosity Stream gave me a list of what was coming up. And check this out. Inside the minds of a con artist. Six episodes. What happens in the minds of a con artist? What makes their brain so well equipped for psychological trickery? <laughs> that being a psycho, maybe? When we think of con artists, we think of big, larger than life personalities, slick talking, fast moving, masters of deception. Look, I won't read anymore. Let me just say, I'm gonna watch this show. I'm almost certainly gonna love this show. I love all the con artist stuff. And I think you will too. By the time this goes out, that's probably available. So go check out Curiosity Stream now. And what is that special deal? Yes, I have a special deal. Of course they do. Go to curiositystream.com slash criminalist. You'll get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And for you guys, use the promo code criminalist and you'll get 25% off, which comes out to only $14.99. $14.99 American cents a year. That's just $1.25 a month. That is absurdly cheap. It's a great deal. Again, curiositystream.com slash criminalist, 25% off, making it $14.99 the whole year. And now back to today's video. The Investigation 
from the police's arrival there were multiple mistakes made by the investigators in the first few days evidence was mishandled and the general public had been able to access the scene for about 12 hours prior to their arrival <laughs> what are you doing general public oh look a murder scene some bodies i guess this was back in the day so they weren't like you know they had to watch like 700 episodes of csi and weren't like oh <laughs> if my footprints get in there that's gonna be an issue <laughs> they're just like check it out bodies oh <laughs> and there also wasn't tv to entertain them the coroner arrived the day following the discovery of the bodies and established that the murders had occurred between late on the night of the 31st of march and early on the morning of the 1st of april the evidence showed that the murder weapon was a piece of farm equipment called a mattock which is kind of like a combination tool between a pickaxe and an adza okay great that's a really helpful description except i have no idea what an adza is it was confirmed that the family did own a mattock but that it was nowhere to be found on the property meaning the killer had taken the tool after they left well gotta say pretty good plan if you're a murderer you gotta dispose of the murder weapon don't leave it at the scene everybody knows that there's gonna be lots of evidence on there even if you, like don't wipe it off don't wipe off those fingerprints throw it in the river burn it in a fire bury it somewhere where it will never be found it's not that hard criminals come on but those aren't the details that have made this case famous indeed those are probably the only bits of the case that have some semblance of normality from here it starts to get a little bit weird the first thing that became clear was that the four victims had been lured out of their home into the barn one by one the killer or killers then killed them with the mattock as they entered and moved the body out of sight before luring the next victim into the barn though it's not known how the killer or killers did this for one thing testing showed that a human scream wasn't loud enough to carry from the barns of the house then there was the fact that nobody can think of a reasonable cause for each individual family member to enter the barn one by one without one of them being suspicious enough to ask the other family members to go with them the bodies showed no signs of fright which meant that each one had been surprised by the attacks immediately i'm thinking that this is someone they know and trust whoever's killed them it's like family family friend something like that because why would you be if it was like a mate of yours and he was out in your barn and two of your family had gone out there to the barn to help like one by one and then they were like hey 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 come over here come over here and see this can you help with this you'll be like okay ba, 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 ba. and then boom mattock in the face yeah so i feel like it's someone they know right in a horrible twist cc was likely the last one to die there were tufts of her hair laying in the hay and in her hands meaning that she hadn't been killed instantly by the impacts but lay there dying for several hours and as the investigation continued things only got weirder looking around the loft of the barn and the attic of the house there were furrows in the hay that was being used as insulation meaning that someone had been using both locations as a place to sleep i told you there's someone living in their house after murdering them what the f so what should i do i'm just gonna sleep above this murdered family and their children you f***ing psycho andrea's body was found in his underwear and a shirt victoria and celia were wearing the working day clothes and cece was wearing only a shirt there wasn't any evidence of sexual assault by or on to anyone maria baumgartner was fully dressed and was found in the kitchen joseph was found in his stroller and had sustained the same injuries as all the others but to a greater extent thanks to his small size all the beds in the house were disturbed and unmade which may have been caused by the perpetrators or family members the fact that cc and andreas were half dressed would suggest that they'd been in bed at the time after several days of investigating it also became clear that the perpetrators had been living in the house for several days after the murders why <laughs> food was missing from the pantry the fire had been lit as recently as the day before the discovery of the bodies many of the family's chores had been done and the animals and the dog had been fed is this person like some sort of homeless dude who's psycho enough to kill an entire family just to have a place to sleep for a few days that is super f***ed up and interviews with those living in the surrounding area only created more questions first were those who had visited the farm in between the time of the murders and their discovery it became clear that the killer had been inside the house when the mechanics that had worked on the food processing machine had been there explaining why the dog had disappeared once he had finished working then it came out in the days and weeks leading up to the 31st of march that there had been many strange going ons around the farm in early november of the previous year a newspaper was found on the property that hadn't been ordered by anyone in the family what was strange about this was that the paper in question was sold only in munich 70 kilometers away and was not ordered by anyone in the local or surrounding towns and villages well then it's someone from further afield who came from munich and was reading the paper and for some reason despite taking the murder weapon was like yeah i'll just leave that evidence everywhere <laughs> gives people an idea of my location or is possibly something intentionally done to throw them off because i still think it's someone they know 
it's either that or someone who won their trust very quickly, which I guess is entirely possible. Like, I don't think it's so unbelievable that they managed to lure people out one by one to the barn. I don't find that to be so insane. But let's take it on face value, and let's say that it's probably someone who's traveled from Munich who knows the family somewhat, even though not all of this is even super likely or whatever, but it's, you know, going on what we've got. Then there was the maid who worked on the farm prior to Maria Baumgarter. During her interview, she explained that her reason for quitting was that she believed the house to be haunted. When asked why, she explained that for several months she and the family had been hearing strange noises coming from the attic of the house and said that they sounded like footsteps. Okay. <laughs> Look, if I'm in my house, just chilling out, you know, watching some telly, and I start here like some noise up in the attic and some footsteps going around, and I'm supposed to be there by myself, the first thing I'm doing is I'm going to grab a fucking bat <laughs> and I'm going to go up there. I think. I'm just wondering about this now. If I was there, I'd be like, oh, I'm so scared. I don't have a gun or anything. So I'd be like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> We're just in the house. There's this noise upstairs. That would be terrifying. I don't know what to do. My house is in the middle of nowhere. Oh, God. That would be so scary. But you can't just let... But there's loads of you. It's a whole family. If I was there with my whole family... I'd be like, go downstairs. <laughs> Dad's going to handle this. But let's say... I don't know. You've got like... Was the two dudes? Oh no, the other dude was dead, so it's only the old man to sort it out, which would... I don't know what I would do. Fortunately, it's not a problem I have to worry about, because there's not a man living in my attic who's later going to murder me and my entire family. Fingers crossed. Well, I, I hope you are right, sir. This has been corroborated by other seasonal workers who had been on the farm during this period and people that members of the family had spoken to about the problem. What you <laughs> Yeah, there might be the, the house might be haunted. Either that or there's a murderer in the attic. So have you been up there to check? Nah. Nah, I haven't checked that out yet. I'm a, I'm a little bit nervous to go up there and see who's up there. So we're just gonna let him continue. <laughs> Maybe the police. Maybe call the mayor. On several occasions, Andreas is reported to have searched the attic but found nothing. Oh thank God. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Interviewing the neighbors, the investigators found out that only days before the attacks happened, Andreas Gruber had told them that he had found two sets of footprints walking side by side in the freshly fallen snow. They started the forest behind their house and went straight to the farm's machine shed. What was strange was that these footprints did not return to the forest, but ended at the machine shed door. The lock had been broken, but nothing was missing from inside. The final and most recent bit of information that they got from their neighbors was that on the day of the 31st, Cece had attended school. She had told her friends uh, that the previous night her mother Victoria had fled the house following a violent quarrel, though it wasn't clear who she had been arguing with, and she was found hours later in the woods behind the house. At first, police thought that the murders may have been financially motivated, a robbery gone wrong, if you will. After all, the family were known in the area to be quite wealthy, and it was rumored that a large stash of gold and cash was somewhere in the house. This was corroborated by the fact that they found a large stash of gold and cash in the house. Okay. <laughs> There's gold in there. No, there really was. The police found it. Although apparently, if it was a robbery, they didn't. Um, I'm not sure if I'd put a lot on the violent quarrel thing. People quarrel all the time. It doesn't mean that they're going to murder their families. Um, also, if it was financially motivated, why didn't they take the golden cash? And did investigators like dare apart every sofa and floorboard to find that? Because I feel like the robbers would also do that because they've got days in there after murdering the family. Wouldn't they be looking for that golden cash? I don't think either of these are particularly convincing options and also if it's someone from munich are they really going to be aware of some house 70 kilometers away that might have gold in it doesn't seem very likely the problem was that with all the other evidence of strange happenings going on around the farm and the fact that they actually found the golden cash still in the house it's unlikely this was a robbery the robbers had days to find their gold exactly if they had been looking for it there's no chance they wouldn't have found it the investigators suspected there was something else going on here okay so the gold apparently wasn't even that well hidden based on the evidence and information gathered during interviews the investigators knew that whomever had done this must have had some reason other than financial gain which opened the door to a much wider a pool of possibilities like the spurned lover someone with a grudge a personal vendetta a drifter who had taken up residence in the attic or just somebody who traveled the countryside killing whatever the case it was important that the police find anyone who might have cause to kill them the family so 
we've met the family why don't we spend a bit of time getting to know them first we have andreas who was the head of the family reports on his character have been varied but the majority of them agree on a few things he was unpleasant a devout christian rude a bit of an oddball and misery or as we brits like to put it a bit of a tight ass there was also that other part of his personality the incestualist part because this case is apparently every kind of weird wait does incestualist mean that he's he's into incest oh god <laughs> oh sorry i realize i ris misread misery uh it should be miserly so that makes i was like doesn't tight ass mean like cheap and then i see it's miserly not misery there we go I'd like to offer my congratulations to all of the viewers and listeners who picked up on the discrepancy between the date that Carl Gabriel died and the fact that Victoria had a two-year-old son and no new husband. Oh my god, you have to be an absolute paying attention legend to figure that out. <laughs> I'm still not even figuring it out now that you've written it, Angus. If you didn't spot the difference or need a reminder, Carl Gabriel was Victoria's husband and the father of Cece. He died in France seven years before the events of the farm, leaving a five-year gap between the death and birth of the youngest member of the family, baby Joseph, and Victoria's father was the one who filled that gap. Oh my god. No, you f***ing didn't. I mean, one, I'm pretty surprised I didn't pick up on that because the baby's two and it was seven years since the war. That's a big difference. And also the father is the grandfather dude what the f this incestuous relationship um <laughs> i'm like i just read ahead like three words and uh and angus immediately corrects himself to say or rather abuse yeah that ain't a relationship <laughs> That's a crime. Have been officially documented when both Victoria and Andreas were convicted of it by a court when Joseph was born, so the whole town knew. Going forward, just bear all that in mind as it'll become quite relevant later. You've got to be a f pariah in the town. And also, how are you free? The baby's two, so you raped your daughter at least two years ago. How the f are you not in prison? What the f? Or just, I mean, this is the past, can't we do a pop-pop, you know? But that's not an excuse. There isn't much to be said about the older Cecilia. She had been the owner of the farm when she married Andreas Gruber, making him the property owner. After getting married, the Grubers ultimately had three children, of which Victoria Gruber would be the only surviving child. Though this isn't purely down to the high child mortality rate at the time. Later interviews with neighbours talked about how the three children suffered at the hands of their parents. One of the neighbours is quoted as saying, quite frankly, they weren't good people. The small children had to stay in the cellar for days, and when you pass Passed by, you could hear the children crying in the cellar, so they were winning no awards for parenting. These sound like the worst f parents that I've ever seen on the Casual Criminalist, and we're set that's saying something. Two of their children have died, possibly from abuse, and they raped one of them. Um, so yeah, that is uh, not no awards for parenting. You'd win awards for worse parenting. This is extremely shocking. We're bad parents. It's safe to say that Victoria was not happy. <laughs> is it angus could we say that could we i don't know maybe she loves it christ that was sarcasm by the way in fact it was the neighbor that discovered the bodies of the family that gave us the deepest insight into the mind of victoria lorenz schlittenbauer was also a farmer though for some reason i've also seen him referred to as the sled builder and i really don't know why possibly a poor translation anyway about a year after her husband's death victoria began hanging around lorenz's farm to chat with him i personally read statements given by him and it must be said that for a woman living in this time i'm rather impressed by how brazen victoria was with her advances towards lorenz lorenz was married at the time though so he rebuffed her advances. But when Lorenz's wife died several years later, he and Victoria began courting each other once again. Though this never progressed to marriage, there were several facts about this relationship that are notable. Even though they were never married, Victoria did care for Lorenz, and she confided in him that her father was having the incestuous relationship with her, and that this had begun shortly after her husband had died. When Victoria got pregnant, and owing to the timeline, she and Lorenz both knew that Victoria's father was the father of the child. But now we can't be certain if Andreas played the banjo, but but I feel confident that there was at least some magic music being played in the vicinity on a regular basis. Angus. Mate, I'm not sure if this is the time for that joke. <laughs> this is so f***ed up. Victoria didn't want it known that her father was doing this, and so she begged Lorenz to do the necessary paperwork to make him the father. However, this cost a fairly large sum of money, as some that Victoria stole from the aforementioned stash of cash that was in the house. 
Without drawing out the entire sordid affair, Lorenz and Andreas had a falling out over the money, which ultimately led to Lorenz outing Andreas and Victoria for the nature of their relationship. Honestly, mate, um, I feel like, you know, that's like phrased negatively, he outed them. I'd be like, she is being abused and you going to the police about that is absolutely the f***ing right move mate well done although somehow he still goes free and he's around living in the same house as the person he abused rather than at the end of a gallows or in prison dude what's the what the past everybody the concerned neighbor now, once investigators heard about this little transposition, they began taking a bit more interest in Lorenz himself. And the more they looked, the guiltier he became. Remember when Lorenz first went looking around the farm? He chose to break down the door of the barn, saying that he could hear noises. The strange thing about this was that he already had a key to the main house on him. In fact, he was the only person in the entire area, other than the family members themselves, who had a key to the farmhouse. If we are to assume that he thought the family was still alive, why would he make the decision to commit property damage instead of using the key? that he already had. According to the two people that had assisted Lorenz in the search of the farm, once they had found the bodies in the barn, Lorenz had left the pair of them to search the house. Apparently, his companions argued with him, saying that the killer may still be in the house, though he seemed to have no concern for this, saying, I'm going to find my son, referring to the two-year-old Joseph. Then, during the interviews with Lorenz's sons, the police found out that Lorenz had not returned home on the night of the murders, though according to Lorenz, he had been working late and decided to sleep in his barn. That is mad suspicious Lorenz <laughs> very suspicious you have the motivation you don't have an alibi although I feel it a bit heavy to you know why not just murder the the incestuous granddad why not murder just him and leave everyone else alone that I mean I understand that your relationship didn't work out but come on I don't think that's he doesn't I mean I don't know the guy but it doesn't seem like he'd go that far all of a sudden, Lorenz was in some very hot water, and the police's theory went as followed. The night before the murders, Lorenz had gone round to the farm to discuss something with Victoria. This became a heated argument and caused her to flee from the house. Then the next day, Lorenz finished his work and made his way over to the house once again. Upon arrival, he asked if he could speak to Victoria privately and took her to the barn. Whether premeditated or not, this ultimately resulted in Lorenz taking the matter from the wall and killing Victoria with it. He then returned to the house and individually asked the family members to accompany him to the barn where he killed them yeah it's not a bad theory though is it as simon may or may not have just pointed out there are some gaping flaws in this theory we'll get to those in a minute <laughs> oh no <laughs> these flaws don't feel so gaping normally i'm like yeah, this and that and this and this time i'm like not a bad theory not bad i mean the biggest one is the motivation why not just kill the the incestuous granddad so he lured the family members out of the house individually and then once he was done he decided to finish the maid and the infant who had begun the whole thing then the next day realizing the implications of what he had done he began visiting the house and attending to the family's chores so to buy himself time to think about his next move finally after their absence began getting noticed he decided to discover the bodies for himself this theory explains why someone would live in the house after the murders and why he did didn't just check the door with his key when he was first visiting. He explains why he was unconcerned about the possibility of the killer still being in the house, and also why he wanted to go in alone if it meant that he could do one last sweep for evidence. Well, if he wanted to sweep for evidence, he's had days of doing their chores, so I don't think that's particularly likely. He might want to go in alone mm, because he's brave and he's like, You guys wait here, I'm gonna check the house out for a killer. Possibly. But in my opinion, this theory is iffy at best. I agree. I'm not sure what these gaping flaws in the theory are, but it already feels iffy to me. Yes, it supplies the motive, but after that, it's all downhill. The other way, he doesn't have an alibi, which I think is notable. Like, yeah, yeah, he slept in the barn. Does he sleep in the barn regularly? If yes, then... Uh... Sure, he had a feud with Andreas, but that particular feud had allegedly been resolved. They had buried the hatchet months before the killings and were on good terms again, a fact that is corroborated by both Lorenz himself, while well, that counts for nothing, and others who lived in the area and knew of the issue. <laughs> knew of the issue. So, uh, why did you break up with your girlfriend? Oh, I dropped a dime on her for having an incestuous relationship with her dad. <laughs> Holy sh**. 
A lot of crazy people out there. Then there is the fact that it's unrealistic to assume Lorenz, who had just committed a brutal murder, was compass mentis enough to think of an excuse for individually luring four people out of their home in the middle of the night without one of them being the least bit suspicious. I've been at this for days and I can't think of one. Um, I disagree with that, kind of totally. I think that he would be able to do that. Like, people react to things in different way. And if he's just murdered someone, it's just a, you know, that's a high stress situation. Maybe he performs well in high stress situations. Like, I'm pretty good at that. Like, if something major is going on, I can put my thoughts together fairly quickly and deal with the situation. So, for example, if I've murdered someone in the past, <laughs> yeah, I could think of a reason to be able to lure out the other people from the house of the barn, especially because they know me. I don't think it's that challenging. Are you sure? Then there were the coffee sellers who went straight to Lorenz's house after leaving the farm. There was no way that he could have beaten them there if it had been in the house. They say there was almost certainly someone tending the stove inside the house when they knocked, so the killer must still have been inside. Now that is way, way stronger evidence for Lorenz not doing this, isn't it? Finally, and this is just my own opinion, I've read a lot about Lorenz and read his interviews. Though it is only from the written word and I have no way to confirm this, he just doesn't seem like the type to commit a murder. He was reasonable and cooperative with the police. He also volunteered the story about the disagreement with Andreas. If he had been the murderer, surely he would have avoided talking about his motive at all cost, or at least downplayed it. Totally agree. Ultimately, there wasn't enough evidence to convict Lorenz and he was let go. Wait, Angus, what are these gaping, obvious things? We're, I'm only being introduced to the idea of there definitely being someone in the house and him and them not being able to make it to the house before Lorenz, the coffee sellers. So I didn't know about that. The only one was about luring people to the barn, which I think is totally possible. So I wouldn't say there are any gaping holes in this. I think it's a reasonable theory. The coffee sellers thing and the person doing the stove inside would imply that there is at least someone else involved. Um... I don't think there's anywhere close to enough evidence for this to be Lorenz, but I also don't think there are gaping holes in the theory. In spite of this, he never managed to live down the arrest, and for the rest of his life he was seen as the killer of Hinterkaifeck. <laughs> Though this didn't seem to hurt him too much, as he fought and won several lawsuits against his most outspoken defamers. Outside of Lorenz's arrest and subsequent release, the police could come up with next to no other potential suspects, and only a few arrests were made in the years following the murders. However, this story stuck in the public's mind, and there have been many subsequent investigations that resulted in one arrest and many, many more theories, a few of which we're going to cover now. The Theories First was the theory of an unwelcome guest. All of the strange happenings going on around the farm in the weeks and months leading up to the murder suggest that there was an unknown person or persons living somewhere on the farm without the family's knowledge. This would explain why there was no sign of someone breaking into the house. The depressions in the hay insulation in both the barn and the house attic are indicative of someone sleeping there, and it would explain why they continued to eat the food and tend to the farm after the murders. If this was the case, then something must have caused them to come out of hiding and commit the murders on that night. This theory states that the killer or killers were discovered by Cecilia or Victoria. They then killed them as to avoid being detected. When they didn't return the family members individually, I went to the barn to go searching for them. This sounds like a totally reasonable theory, because the Lorenz thing doesn't explain about the person sleeping in the attic, which seems pretty locked down. There were like sounds, they went on for a while, there were depressions in the hay. I'd say there's someone living in the roof. And look, if there's someone living in the roof, how far is it for them to step up to murder? <laughs> yeah. Though I haven't seen anything mentioned about this online, I find it hard to believe that Cece and Andreas both individually made the decision to enter the barn or they realized the other two were missing, partly because they were both half naked, meaning they would both be getting ready for bed. If they had willingly chosen to go outside, why did they do it separately and not at least put trousers on before going? And if they were forced out of the house, why was Maria Baumgarter still there? I'm not trying to lead you to some conclusion here, I'm genuinely asking. There aren't any answers to this that I can find, and I can't think of a way that a person could convince these two to leave the house without alerting Maria Baumgartner and the baby. Whichever way you spin it, it doesn't make sense. If they had been forced out, it's reasonable that at least one person would have fought back, especially if they thought their life or the life of the baby was at risk. But there's no evidence that any of the inhabitants did. I don't know. Did people fight back? Let's assume they had some sort of weapon, maybe. Possibly even a gun. We don't know. Maybe they just chose the mattock instead of the gun as the murder weapon later. Yeah, I don't I don't understand why Angus you have such a trouble of them 
going out to the barn. Like, whether it's by being lured or whether it's them being forced, I don't think it's that hard to make people do sh Whether it's like, hey, come check out this thing in the barn or get out in the barn, I've got a fucking gun. <laughs> and uh, don't fight back or I will shoot you. It doesn't seem that unreasonable, does it? Comments, let me know. Am I insane? The next theory is that it was the work of a vagrant or a traveling salesman. However, this was quickly disproven because, again, there was a big stash of money that would have been taken otherwise. Also, there was nobody spotted in the surrounding area during the weeks prior or following the murders that fit the description, and anybody that was found had an alibi. After that, the theories become more and more outlandish. One is that the killer was none other than Carl Gabriel. If that name is familiar, it isn't. Don't worry, I was confused too. He was Victoria's dead husband. Oh yeah, okay, well... <laughs> what, who died in the war seven years previously and just came back to murder the entire family like a psycho? So yeah, so I'll let you figure out the implications of that one. In a bizarre twist that I still can't wrap my head around, this theory has gotten a lot of more credence than I think it's due, considering the facts available. Um, are there any facts? Pretty much, there are two pieces of evidence for this theory. Okay, let's go. Uh, these are going to be super flimsy, aren't they? First of all, his body was never recovered from no man's land in France. Second was that it... That's it. Do you know how many bodies weren't recovered after the first? Do you know how many bodies there were? It was a lot. Second was that at some point in his life, he had expressed a desire to move to the USSR. Um... Okay. The theory says that when he ran into no man's land, he somehow managed to not get shot for real, but did manage to fake getting shot. Then he somehow managed to crawl out of no man's land without either side noticing or shooting him. Then he somehow managed to make it back to Hintakaifek without getting picked up for desertion. Then for some reason decided to move into the attic again without getting noticed and then proceeded to kill his whole family. And then he ran away to the USSR. No, 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 no. Just no. Do we need to? Do I need to go into more reasons why that is f***ing absurd? Or can we just draw a line under that and move on? Why would he go back to his family's house? If he's running away to the USSR, he'd have no reason to. Just sleep in any barn. Why would you go back to Intakaifek? It makes no sense. Why would you go back and just murder your family? It makes no sense. What? No. No, no, no. Drawing a line, moving on. The only other piece of evidence for this was at the end of World War II, some German prisoners of war spoke out about a German-speaking Soviet who had released them. This Soviet claimed to be the killer of Hinterkaifeck. I have the foggiest idea why this theory even made it onto the Wikipedia article, let alone the police reports and the online discussion forums. Well, why not make it into the police reports? It seems kind of relevant. Um, it's the that's the only piece of evidence that I find halfway reliable in any way. What's wrong with that evidence, Angus? After that, we have the theory that it was a group of people all acting in concert. When the investigation began to run out of suspects, the investigators called in Miss J.U. In a move that's simply baffling to me, and more likely because of the era that this investigation occurred in, the investigators decided they should try a psychic, just trying a description of those involved. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know your investigation's gone nowhere. It's like, so, detective, where are we at the investigation, the murder of my family? Well, uh, we brought... Good news. Good news. We've brought in a psychic. Bad news. We've brought in a psychic. <laughs> As Simon has undoubtedly just pointed out, this is an absolutely ridiculous route to go down, and the transcripts read as such. When the spiritualist known as Miss J.U. entered the Intergaifek farm, she began to have premonitions that were actually very helpful in giving us a detailed and accurate description of the two men who were tracked down, arrested, and convicted. Wait, no, hold on. <laughs> My bad. I must have misread the transcript. What she actually did was f all, because she's a psychic and she can't solve crimes. Psychics do nothing. Leave them alone. Don't give them any of your money. It's just a scam. F all of that. They're just scammers taking your money. They're like magicians. If you're a magician and you can't make any money, become a psychic. You'll make money and you don't even have to be good at magic. You just have to be a little bit better than the average bear. I'll give you a quick summary of her statement. She started by identifying a man with broad shoulders. Then she saw a man with dark, slicked back hair. Then she started wandering around the house talking about the maid. Then she started talking to the maid. Then she started talking to Cece. And she started giving her description of the killer's walk to the house, the sound of the chickens in the barn, and things like that. Then she started talking about a group of three black men, all arguing about whether they should kill the infants. And then she got a headache and stopped. Well, thank you very much, Miss J.U. That was super helpful. 
Everyone be on the lookout for a tall man with broad shoulders and slick back hair. Shouldn't be too difficult to find in 1920s Germany. As for the three black men she mentioned, they inquired about that, and it will surprise absolutely nobody to hear that not a single person had has ever seen a group of three roaming black men in the area. And what, this is 1920s Germany? Uh, I'm gonna guess that those dudes are gonna stand out in some uh, farm in the middle of nowhere in Germany. Don't worry, Miss J.U., everyone makes mistakes. I mean, who among us hasn't confused a racist worldview with visions from the spirit realm, hmm? <laughs> F*** all of this. F*** these people. She got paid for that, and I hate her. And I hate all of you men out there doing this nonsense. The Final Suspect as the months and years came to pass, it started to become apparent just how poorly the investigation had been handled by the police and the coroner. Once the autopsies had been conducted on the bodies, the heads of each victim were removed okay, <laughs> and sent to Munich to be studied. The transit process and the prepping of the heads for study destroyed a good deal of evidence that could have been pulled, though I have been able to find out what precisely that might be. The result was that they couldn't be certain of any results other than the knowledge that the victims were indeed dead. Then, a couple of decades later, the skulls were lost entirely during the heavy bombing sustained by most German cities during World War II. The bodies were buried as a group, excluding the maid who was buried by her family elsewhere. All of them were still missing their heads, of course that is super weird why <laughs> why wouldn't you just send the whole body you send just the head what to save on postage what the f several years after the killing the farm was destroyed to make way for more land for growing on which did give us one of the final clues of the investigation that being the missing mattock which had been used as the murder weapon it seemed that it had been stowed in a hidden compartment in the floor of the hayloft in the barn as public attention began to switch to other things like the rise of the nazi party in the second world war the investigation was shelved and became a cold case officially it was closed in 1995 however there was one final chapter to this story allow me to introduce to you the gump brothers adolf and Anton. These two men were suspected as early as a week after the discovery of the bodies. However, they couldn't be found, and then the case was suspended while Germany was doing that whole Nazi thing. However, when the investigation resumed in 1951, a new piece of evidence came to light that made them the number one suspects. On October the 20th, 1941, just shy of 20 years after the murders, an unknown woman lay dying on her deathbed, and as is the custom of Christianity, a pastor was called to her side. In the final moments, she confided to him that her brothers were the murderers of Hinter Kaifek. She explained why they had done it and who they were. Then she told the pastor that he could inform the police of her brother's alleged crimes after her death. The pastor wrote down everything she said on a random slip of paper, gave her a blessing, and then left. However, he chose not to go to the police with this information. Instead, he chose to invoke the seal of confession and gave no testimony because reasons, I guess. Yo, if, if, you're, if you're with a priest, right, and I know nothing about this, I'm not religious, like, and they have, like, the confidentiality thing. It's like, if you have confidentially what? With your, like, doctor, your lawyer, etc. And you're like, no, 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 you can tell someone else about this. I'm pretty sure that that means they can tell someone else about it. It's not like, no, I can't do that. It's like, I'm telling you, you can. And I'm like, no, can't do that. I don't think that's how it works. The only reason that we know about this event at all is because he told a group of 11 children during a Sunday school session. Apparently, it's not just Catholic pastors that ruined childhood. Then, a decade, and a world war passes, and some of the kids seem to remember a creepy guy in Sunday school telling them about a dead woman and her murderous brothers. It's worth pointing out that the people who chose to write to the officers handling the investigation did so independently of each other, and both referenced this event, giving the name of the pastor, which would not be the last time priests got reported by the kids from Sunday Sunday school, holy sh**. <laughs> oh man, Catholicism, what the f*** are you up to? Sorry, I swear, that's the last one. The priest was called Anton Haber, who ran the church in a town called Orsberg. They visited him, and he confirmed that this had indeed happened. However, he could remember nothing of the event, meaning that he had forgotten the name of the woman and therefore her brothers. What's more, he had lost the slip that he'd written the information down on. That sounds a bit convenient, doesn't it? It's like, no, 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 I lost it and forgot about it. What are you talking about? No, I said, why would I didn't tell it? And no, 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 no. And if I did, I forgot. You don't forget that, do you? Like, if someone told me they murdered people, that would stay with me. That's not something I'm going to forget. Although I guess priests take a lot of confessions. And that really says something, doesn't it? If he has genuinely forgotten about it, then he has heard some dark, dark in his life. Because I've never heard anything. I've never heard a secret that intense. And 
yeah there are people who just hear these all the time oh my god he gave all the information he could though and the investigators used this to find a woman who matched the description the name they came up with was krenzans meyer maiden named gump they also found out that prior to her death she had told one of the pastor of her suspicions of her brothers this pastor's name was august ritzel with this information they looked for a verification of their hunch they managed to track him down in a hospital in augsburg he himself was very near death and very weak and could barely speak however when asked the name gump he nodded. The women's brothers, of course, were Anton and Adolf. As I said, the brothers were already suspects in 1922, but couldn't be tracked down. In the intervening decades, Adolf had died, so one of the Gump brothers died too. Anton was still alive. A judge issued a warrant for his arrest, and a manhunt ensued. After several months, he was tracked down to Ingolstadt, a city 30 kilometers north of Hinterkaifeck, and was taken in for questioning. This sounds. This. I mean, this guy sounds guilty as hell, right? This is. So he was suspected back in the day his sister confessed to it and it just happened to match up what are the odds of this this seems like it's these dudes in 1922 anton had gone to live with adolf in his home which was situated several miles from the hinterkaifeck farmstead his presence there was verified by work records from the time adolf for his part had been associated with a different ongoing murder investigation <laughs> <laughs> two brothers two investigations though his involvement was never proven he was known to be a member of a group that had orchestrated a separate murder in the past the little information i could gather about this group says that they weren't a political movement and seemed to just be a group of mates who made a habit of killing farmers holy sh what are you up to anton had been directly involved in this group but is likely to have interacted with them seeing as he was living with adolf at the time of the murders during his interrogation the investigators came at him with all the evidence they could and there was a lot more than the stuff i've just mentioned however it was all circumstantial and easily explained away as for the 31st of april well that's where the speculation begins we can't know if either brother was there his employer had no record of presence or absence on the days around the murders which could have been enough to convict or exonerate him some internet sleuths have proven that the company he worked for was in the midst of a workers strike at the time and so we know with some certainty that he wasn't working on those dates the only other piece of evidence that could be brought against him was something he had said to his cellmate while he was awaiting interrogation to quote and all because of the child when this accusation was leveled he initially reacted indignantly but then he kept quiet and refused to answer any questions for the next few minutes the police had a hunch that his motives may be perhaps because he believed himself to be the father of joseph however uh, this was a very loose theory what was missing was a piece of evidence that gave certain motive and tied him to the family in some way yeah these guys seem super guilty but also what is the motive is there any direct evidence and it's like no and without motive and direct evidence just a bunch of circumstantial stuff and no re no motive it's like yeah that's not happening even though i do think these guys are pretty guilty without this evidence the police could no longer hold him and had to release him after three days the investigation persisted for two more years after the release of anton gump but was eventually shut down in 1955. it has been picked up by various crime investigation agencies but none have been successful and no new clues have been uncovered that was until jumping right into the future here 2006 when one final clue came to the surface a hint of kind of death note no i'm not talking about that anime my friend keeps banging on about <laughs> i have no idea what that is i'm talking about a note that is released when a person dies starting as early as the 17th century people have been writing death notes to spread news of a death or deaths think of it's the being the postcard version of an obituary they contain factual information about the deceased a passage from the bible and perhaps a religious image the interkaifeg murders had several printings of death notes see attached images oh that's not for me to read that's what <laughs> jen to see <laughs> my bad which will be shown on screen now fear not though listeners unless you speak german you're not going to be missing out the death note found in 2006 was one of the printings of the hinterkaifeck death notes this one always conspicuous however for the fact that it had a variety of handwritten notes all over it most of these scrawlings are illegible and faded although some have been deciphered the words are not directly written in german they are in something known as garbelsberger shorthand this is a kind of german abbreviated writing script that uses derivatives of the normal latin alphabet to allow for someone to write faster without missing information at the time it was only scholars and members of the clergy that knew how to use this system as i said not all of it is legible but there have been a few short phrases translated those being god's punishment one year and incest i seem to recall there being a missing piece of evidence in this case i believe it was a slip of paper written by a member of the clergy who had been called to receive a deathbed confession from a woman stating that her brothers were the hinterkaifeck murderers as you may recall anson was quoted saying 
and all because of the child. This may be the missing piece of evidence that gives us the motive of the Gump brothers. Then again, it could be an overzealous member of the clergy that wanted to damn the family for what they were accused of. We don't really know. So the motivation was they just wanted to kill a family because they had like incest going on. In that case, if you they, if that's your motivation, you'd just have killed the like psycho granddad. Why would you have killed everyone else? They're just victims. Wrap up. And those are the hints of Kaifek murders. A sad and rather twisted question mark in the history of crime. The four theories being Lorenz, the unidentified resident, the drifter, or the Gump brothers. Personally, if I think I had to rank them in terms of likelihood, oh, before I read yours, Angus, let me do mine. Um, uh, I want the Gump brothers up top. I want ooh, unidentified residents, the person living in the attic, number two. I want Drifter number three, and I want Lorenz at the bottom, because I don't think it was Lorenz. Ah, oh. yeah, no, I don't think it's Lorenz. Let's see. Oh, really? We can discard the sounds of footsteps in the attic and the random newspaper. It seems too unlikely that there was anybody in the house for that long without anyone noticing. All right, each their own. I think the first time we have any interaction with the Hinterkaifeg murderers was when we found those footsteps leading to the machine room door. I believe that the murderers were hiding in the hidden compartment in the barn where the murders took place and only came out at night when the coast was clear. I... really? On the night of the murders, I believe the murderers exited the hiding spot only to be discovered by Victoria and Cecilia. They were then disposed of in the barn and will have occurred at some time in the mid to late evening. After perhaps an hour or two, it was time for bed. Cece and Andreas were in bed and wondered why the other two had not returned to the barn yet. Andreas went first and was killed, though Cece may have heard him and came running when she was also killed. Finally, the killers thought that they'd finished their job and made their way to the house, whereupon they found the maid and disposed of her. The following morning they were awoken by the sound of the baby and upon the approach of the coffee sellers killed the child to make sure they weren't found after a few days and several people poking around the farm they decided to leave okay yeah reasonable i don't know about them hiding in the the secret compartment in the barn that sounds like a bit of a stretch they could just be hiding anywhere i think that's quite likely and i think it was the gump brothers allegedly in my opinion they gotta be long dead right <laughs> It's certainly not a perfect theory, and there are perhaps some flaws in it, not to mention the fact that it relies on a certain amount of chance and doesn't actually answer who did it. But I think it's the most likely, given all the information. It's unlikely that we'll ever get an answer, though. After nearly a century and such poor management of the evidence to start with, there isn't much cause for hope that we will get closure. The Interkaifeg death notes were a piece that could have solved the puzzle, but again, given so much time has passed, it's unsurprising that they can't confirm anything, and I think it's likely that they will be the last thing to come out of this case. Thankfully, the killer or killers, whoever they are, are long dead and buried, and we don't need to answer these questions as a matter of safety, but rather just interest. So to all of you internet sleuths of the present and future who may find us an answer, I thank you. So, that's the end of today's episode. Thank you, Angus, for writing it. Brilliant stuff. Uh, even though we disagreed on a, the theories a little bit today, didn't we? Thank you, dear viewer or listener, for listening or watching. And if you'd like to leave a review of this podcast, if you're listening, that would be fantastic. Otherwise, like, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And I'll see you next time.